Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, so first of all, thanks for inviting me here for this talk. Uh, it's the last one of the day. I try to make it dry, but also make it work as possible. For who will stay until the end, there, was the, there will be the bonus of some uh, new results. So you will see, but really at the end, sorry about, so only for the one who's staying here. Uh, so the topic, it's um, instead of giving a presentation on, on RS classic one, I mean, we all different angles already covered uh, in the workshop here. I will let you open a uh, research question. We're actually, what we can do differently with RS if we are also using semantic oriented communications. And some of you maybe are not familiar with semantic oriented communication concept that will go through that. And uh, this is somehow here and there, the topic are three projects have been, and I'm coordinating. One is on uh, recon parameters who faces the rise to genius. So I made a presentation about that today. And two new started one, the CG goals, which actually is focused on semantic and goal oriented communication. And the other one is CG DISAC, which actually is focused on distributed intercommunication sensing where we have one of the components is using actually semantic communication for semantic fusion and, uh, and composition consensus. Uh, and then of course, there's also part of this work is done in the, in the TRPR uh, project actually focus on the fundamental research in CG. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, let me borrow this. Uh, it's the only formula we'll use, the one I guess I can use here in a way that uh, is not too aggressive, but at the same time, let me explain the perimeter of this formulation I use here. So let me borrow from Shannon, the expression of a single uh, user in the Gaussian channel capacity for infinite length code. And actually, what have we been doing so far until uh, from, from, uh, from 2G is actually to go for improving the, ca the capacity of the system and how we did actually. So we've been working on roughly increasing the, the, the spectrum uh, size we use, the bandwidth we use, increasing the number of uncorrelated signal paths we have, and somehow working on the spectral efficiency uh, of the system, let's say in real way, working on improving the signal to noise present interference ratio. And, uh, so actually what we are doing, for example, I've been doing, for example, in 5G to achieve this target of a uh, factor of 1,000, we target to have a factor of 10 increase in terms of spectrum, a factor of 10 increase on the number of accurate paths, so roughly a, a factor of 10 in terms of increase of signal to noise present interference ratio. And actually, well, we see that that was not a free meal because for the spectrum, we were, first of all, imagining the existing spectrum already using in the previous generations and also going for a carrier aggregation, then questing for new spectrum. And actually many people said that, for example, we went for this minimal wave spectrum. So I'm going to you know 28 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz and so on. But at the end, you can see that doesn't work well for many reasons. I mean, I would not cite all of them because of your expert here, but definitely in terms of blocking, in terms of propagation, issues in terms also technology, in terms of the energy consumption is there. So this factor 10 here is something that's, uh, I would say we can question ourselves if we're doing going the right direction because at least the complexity and the energy cost beyond that is very, is very huge. Then actually we went to this factor of 10 in terms of number of uncorrelated paths, well, going for MIMO or ultra massive MIMO approaches, go for network densification, small cell, uh, user recon for interagency phases. Uh, at least, I mean, starting speaking about that is not really already in 5G, but I mean, this was kind of a, a trend there. And actually what we see that would work very well was indeed the network densification, but at the cost of the new spectrum. Because actually, if you have a network densification works well, at the end, we start orthogonalizing the spectrum. So we are kind of way back because actually, you can, on paper, in some kind of case, not organize the spectrum through the use of uh, the interference cance uh, cancellation techniques or, or, or some specific, uh, what we done specific pins on beam uh, uh, and so on communication. But at the end, this actually is kind of concurrent state. And then for uh, the improvement of the signal to noise spread interference ratio, actually, what we have been working on in the improvement in the spectral efficiency through the informing, having very High uh, gain, uh, uh, DB, uh, high uh, DBI uh, gains in, in the antennas, so being there directly 
directive that goes very well with the use of spectrum, of course, because you can have smaller antenna elements, so you can have more antennas in, in the sensor phase, so it can be more directive and higher, higher uh, gains in terms of the of the, of the of the communication, but at the same time, it's going high in frequency, you also have more propagation losses. So somehow you also have a price uh, price to pay there. And then actually we have this new modulation cutting schemes, new, refer, new waveforms, some talking about uh, full duplex, I would say it's not real reality in 5G, and, and, uh, and again, the RS here as well. So again, this was not, was not really a free meal. And actually, the question is why we've been ta targeting indeed this factor 1000 of improvement of the capacity when we, what we really want to have a sustainability and sustainable 6G. So why we are pushing the system to, uh, to, to accommodate that much data? We can do it in a different way. So this also goes in a way that how we define that the, all the KPIs in 6G, I will go very briefly, I don't want to speak too much about that, but actually I see that we have the classical approaches of, of our KPIs in 6G, roughly pushing to a backward compatibility with the previous system. So let's say 4G is not able to, to deliver an, an enough capacity, you go for a factor of 100, 1000 more. If maybe new application will need a better latency, so you divide a factor of 10 or whatever and so on. But then you can see also the emergence of some new, uh, okay, okay, what else? Some new uh, KPIs like the energy per goal, but also the inference reliability. We have been conceiving systems where we have a very high target, a very high communication inference. That means you want to blindly transfer bits from one side to another network in the most precise way without caring, which is the effect on potentially intelligent system they are processing that. Let's say you are doing a classification. Maybe some of those errors doesn't change nothing in the classification. So actually what we have now with 6G uh, is the vision of trying to see how effective is the communication to achieve a goal. And for, for which actually you have different way to achieve a goal and that the energy per goal is very important. And also the inferior ability there is very important because what you want to have, have indeed is not just blindly transferred in the perfect way, the bits, but actually that those bits are achieving, are helping to achieve an inferior ability with a given level. And then, of course, it's dependent by the specific application. Uh, then, actually, what we, it's very tough to read there, so I try to read here. It's just no slide on there. So, uh, we have been actually working on generation of a content blind communications. That means at the end, we are transporting, transporting data from one side to another without taking care at all of what is that. Uh, and without also having a, a clue about if it's not, if it's or not useful for achieving something in a programmatic way. So actually there's a, what we did based on, let's call the, the channel approach, what we also channel itself called like the technical problem, where actually we want to uh, accurately or with a given level of approximation, transfer bit from one side to another network. And this actually, this is a network that target data volume with ultra reliable communication. Then actually, if you look from this perspective, and we build from this perspective 6G. What we have, we have uh, at least three pillars for building this ultra reliable content blind communication. First of all, is the exploration of new spectrum. We're actually, I don't know how many of you work on hardware here. Yeah? Okay, nice to see. Yeah, well, I, know, I know you <laughs> you presented. Uh, actually, my group, uh, there's about 100 people working hard on, on, on 6G. And actually, when we speak about uh, Subterrace communication, they always say, yeah, look, if you look what we can do with the real solution technology we have outside, what we have is this one. So there is a death valley of frequency for which we have no solutions. Another frequency for which we have technological solution, but it's not working with the efficiency we need to have. So in true, again, there's not a free meal. But what we do actually, we do apply this machine learning AI technologies in order to compensate, for example, some kind of limitation of hardware, some uh, distortion we have and so on uh, in, in setting different parameters of, of the physical layer. The second pillar is actually the internet communication and sensing, the, which is gaining an extremely good momentum at the moment, uh, which is, for example, the topic of this uh, CG DISAC project and coordinating, uh, where we actually 
I mean, the concepts you are familiar with, you, we, we are integrating the communication and the sensing at the same time for improving the communication, for improving the sensing by coordination, but also for doing the two together and actually sharing the resources. And here, there's a lot of places where actually the machine learning AI is used in order to uh, process, do the data fusion, to, the, to improve in general the, 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 the capability of the system working together. And then we have uh, this third pillar, uh, which I can call in a more generic way, I'd say new materials, intelligence on thin and so on, where actually, again, we have a, um, a heavy, we can have a heavy uh, use of machine learning and, uh, and uh, approaches in order to optimize the use of this or counter intelligence phases in order to enable on demand the, the optimization of uh, selectiveness, and the optimization of, of uh, energy efficiency, secrecy, throughput, uh, uh, electromagnetic field radiation reduction, and so on. And actually, here, what well, you see that at the end, machine learning AI used to optimize the processing and also to optimize the way we orchestrate and we operate the network, but still it's content blind, okay? So we have all this intelligence in the network, but we don't care about what we transmit in the network. And actually you see that this, and this is what the last pillar I said, is setting a kind of paradigm shift in the system for which we come from a, uh, an approach where we fight the uncomfortable the dictate by nature propagation environment and we do that by, as I said before, it could increase the diversity with higher antenna gains, with new modulation cutting scheme and so on, to an approach where we control, we create, we shape on the demand the smart for the environment. And actually at the end, what we do by the use of our account for intelligence phases, actually we uh, control the reflection, the scattering and so on of the, uh, of the channel. But again, here the channel is the wire channel, is the, is the communication wire channel. And then what we do actually, we, we target to have this wireless environment as a service where we, are, we have all this adjustment. At the end, we can boost the dynamic to different areas uh, in, in, in the geographic space where we have higher uh, connectivity uh, capacity or higher localization precision. We improve the energy efficiency. We lower the electromagnetic radiation and so on. But actually all this is done with a pure wireless channel perspective. One of the claim on this talk, that there is another channel we have to take into account is what we call the semantic channel. And then we'll go more into these details. So by having this approach, there are several costs and several uh, issues also that there appears. Uh, and for example, we need to have a vision about, uh, we have to learn or predict actually the propagation environment in order to adapt over time because uh, you cannot adapt every every time slot so you, you you communicate you need to you have control signaling you have to do reconfiguration of the surfaces and so on uh you also have problems about indeed about the overhead as you say to that you have problems about synchronization coordination you have uh, also issues about how you to reconfigure the hardware in truth how much it costs how much energy which is the how, my, how, can, how fast you can go. And also problem of scalability, a scalability problem, for example, which is the, uh, how, many, uh, how many actually uh, elements you can put in a RIS in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a smart way, how many you can switch on, switch off in a dynamic way because you do not always need all this together. And, uh, and then indeed you can ask yourself, how much should I really optimize in a dynamic way the systems? Because uh, I mean, I can have potentially a given gain, you know, but you don't need all the time this gain. And actually this gain is first of all, uh, specified by the goal of the communication. And again, it's not by the reliability of the communication, but for example, by the inference reliability of the, of the AI agent that's at the end of the, uh, of the pipe. So one approach is to go for what we call the semantic oriented communications, where actually we uh, want to say less we learn with precision, but understand more. We can also take an example that, uh, I mean, most of us are not US or UK native, I would say. And actually for most of us, the English is not the first language. So I have, I do errors in my pronunciation. You might also have your limitation in understanding, but we do and, and indeed assign each other because we actually we have this reason capability for both sides for which then we're able to correct errors and indeed make more robust the communication. It's actually what I'm speaking about here. 
is actually, if you take from a semantic aware perspective, where actually what you do is not to just blandly send bits from one part to another of the network, but send message which has a specific meaning interpreted by the transmitter and that can be interpreted by receiver. For example, if I tell you, let's meet in the weekend, okay, if we have or the same logic of, of transmitter receiver, you understand maybe there's a, a Saturday and Sunday, but if you are from different culture, it can be for you Friday and Saturday, and for me, sun, Saturday and Sunday. So you can see that we have from one side, the capability of correcting errors, because actually some words can be understood with, with a degree of, of, of error, but at the same time, you can also perfectly receive all the bits in the perfect way and don't get a clue what I'm speaking about. So there is this aspect. And then in this approach, you can see that from the interior communication sensing approach, you have an interesting contribution uh, uh, from semantic communication that actually is on the semantic fusion. So you might have different sense uh, information that you can fusion a different way through the semantics. You can also compose actually concept in the semantic. And then you have in the in the uh, RS approach, actually in their case, actually you can use the semantic and wireless uh, co uh, communication channel together. We'll show you here some, some example for which at the end you can relax the configuration or the performance in the areas because at the end you're able to correct some errors from the semantic level. And then you also have the pure semantic approach where actually what you do, you want to intertween, you want to have cooperation between the intelligent agents for which at the end you, again, you don't need to, to send all the data, but selectively you can send what is needed to understand the receiver. Okay. Um, yeah, so this actually is not magic uh, ideas that come from nothing. Already Shannon 70 plus years ago divided a communication system in three major levels. The level A, which is the technical level, the one we are familiar with, let's say. Uh, most of you are definitely the expert uh, on the topic. Then there's the level B, actually what also was called the semantic problem, we actually deal with how precisely do the transmitter symbol convey the desired meaning. And the level C, will also being called the effectiveness level, where actually deals with how effective does the received meaning affect to conduct the desired way. So you receive the data, correct and not correct way, but at the end, is the data useful for do what you have to do? Can you do your inference? Can you do your classification? Can you do your control? And actually this translates in a very schematic way of this kind of system where you have at the level A where you know, you have all the, I mean, it's very schematic here, you know, the search and encoder, the traffic engineer, it includes also the modulation coding schemes, all the all the things that you have a physical channel with noise interference, and then you have the inverse function of the receiver. And actually in classical case, you, you have X, you want you transmit, you want to have X first to be as close as possible to X. And then on the upper layer, you have the semantic one where actually from the data, or you do you generate semantic uh, uh, semantic message? Let's say you have a text, just to make it easy, and actually you you just extract the keywords of in, interest of understanding. Most of you, if any of you will remember anything from my talk, maybe it will be five to ten keywords that you'll put together in relation semantic good for whatever, semantic use uh, useless for something else. You know this at the end what what you're doing here with all this data. I mean I'm speaking for about an hour. And then again, we'll be summarized with 10 words if I'm lucky at the end of the day. So then actually you have the receiver, the interpretation of the semantic, but if you're not using the same logic, if you do not have the same background, so if some keywords are not the same, actually you have what we call the semantic channel, which is not transparent, is introducing errors. And then you have this semantic errors and semantic noise. And then on the upper layer, you have the destination, destination and the source, they interact with a free environment. Like things, for example, two robots cooperating together, they have a playground for cooperation. This is the environment I'm speaking about. So, um, so what, what we have here is a, a second paradigm shift that we move from um, ultra reliable quantum blind transmission without understanding, where actually at the transmitter, you actually, you determine, determine what you want to send. So it's not about what is useful for the receiver, is the, the transmitter deciding. And that all the data has the same relevance without a specific meaning at the receiver. And then actually you also impose very costly uh, bit fidelity in doing that. So 
is somehow it's random for the transmitter. I mean, it doesn't have meaning and, and want to be precise. And actually go to another approach, which is what we call the, the semantic uh, approach, where actually you communicate only what cannot be deduced or predicted by the AI. I would also add by a generative AI. That means at the end, you can really send a few elements they are missing to understand or, or a, a specific context or a specific action to do. And uh, so we move here from the exact exchange of raw data to share knowledge that cannot be uh, uh, reliably deduced or inferred by the, uh, by the receiver itself without having this input. So we just send some other input for, for that. Uh, yes, and then actually, uh, this has a potential impact on the on the on the physical uh, system because uh, if you look at the systematic impact of, of the of the semantic communication on the physical wireless environment, you, you so you have you have two two parts. First of all, if you have a very good physical wireless channel, for example, using the best wrist ever, okay, then bits are perfectly received at the receiver, so there's no error. For example, let's say we are a job interview. And I tell you something, you understand you are fired, okay? Job interview, so you cannot be fired. So from a semantic point of view, you can you can correct fire with hire, okay? But of course, if I don't do this error because I have a very good physical channel and then you understand hire, there's not this processing at the semantic level. So as, as, as much as you have a physical channel, which is good, you have few errors to the receiver, you, you have less, ambiguity of the semantic channel because you, you have less options of errors you have. But at the same time, when you have the semantic channel, you're able to correct some of this error because there's a logic for which some statements, some proposition are not possible. Some charts are not possible in your classification in fields. And then there is also the, 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 the physical layer. If it's, it's very good in terms of this performance, so you have, again, the best errors ever, then also on the control channel, you have no errors. So when you indicate the mode as 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 in a physical channel. If you indicate the mode for for the semantic way you want to do the language you want to use and so on. If you do not have errors, you help the semantic system. But what actually is more of interest from my perspective is that actually the defect that we have from the semantic channel to the physical wireless uh, system because because you are adding this capability of uh, uh, robustify the communication, so be able to correct uh, some errors. Then the, at the end, what you can do, you can relax some constraints. And uh, so what I'm saying, for example, if you take this case, uh, this uh, is a paper we published a couple of years ago, uh, then we compare what? We compare, uh, it was a case of text transmission, NLP, okay? Where actually the, the, the beta rate or the packet rate actually met, we have an NLP at the end is what we call the blue score. It's something very similar. That means actually you take the text and then you find for words they are, they are, they are equivalent. So maybe, for example, I say, say weekend and say Saturday and Sunday, if it's in the same logic, there's equivalent. So you can also translate in a different way it works. And actually when you have 100% of this blue score, it means you have a, a perfect uh, communication. And then we have a zero, you have a, you have a very bad one. So you, you understand nothing. So you compare this blue and so blue and red curves are approach where you do not use a semantic approach and uh, you use a classical approach for 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 uh, for data protection and uh, and actually you have the green one where actually you have the semantic approach and what you see what is important to see here is that to achieve a given level of a blue score let's say uh, almost uh, 100% if you use for example the red curve you need something around here in the example, 20 plus dBs. If you use the, 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 the blue line, is even more. But actually, if you use the, the, the semantic approach, you need seven, eight, uh, nine, whatever dBs. So what happened here, that, that what it means, that you can work with a much worse channel to have the same result at the end of the communication. That means that actually you can take your risks, you can break some diets, okay? <laughs> I'm kidding, but you just have some less elements, that can be enough, you know, because maybe you go, your DBI antennas go, go very down, but you don't need all that. Or in more in a smart, smart way, you can switch off part of this antenna so you can resize the, the, the antenna with a smaller one. 
And uh, so actually, this is what, what I show here. Maybe just just move it because otherwise I, I will get some kind of a wooded neck. Okay. Uh, so here is an example of what we, we show you. We did experimentation the same way in this way. We have a, a RS of 40 by 40 elements. Okay. That we dynamic can, can, can switch off some of these elements. We also switch off these elements in, in, in a smart way. So we have a pattern for which we, we if you have to switch 10%, we switch the good 10%. If you have to switch 20%, we switch the good 20%. And we use uh, a semantic communication. So all we see what we compare here, the colors of the one or before. So we compare the case where we do uh, communication uh, without the semantic approach. Uh, we compare two cases where we do no phase quantization, we do one bit phase quantization. And then we compare where we use the, the, the semantic approach. And then we see which is the blue score. Remember, 100% would like to have the most. Uh, uh, in in uh, comparing for different configuration, the RS will we have a, a percentage of, 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 the, of these uh, RS elements that are active. And then you see that to achieve a given blue score, uh, for example, let's say 90%, uh, we would uh, with actually uh, the one uh, one bit phase quantization for uh, the less effective approach, which are without a uh, Semantic communication, you need rough to be around 45% of the elements on, on this, on this uh, 40 by 30. But if you compare with, a, with the same configuration of uh, bit phase quantization with, with, with a semantic approach, you need something around, you know, five, six, seven uh, percent of the elements. And again, if you, if you compare with, a, with, a, with, with, with that approach, you see that roughly you have uh, something that goes for a factor of four in this setting of reduction elements you need where there's no quantization and a factor of six plus something when you have uh, one bit quantization. And this is one of the setting. The, the, we have other numbers. There's not necessarily the most convenient one in terms of the gain, but just to show you. And actually, so this idea, because you can somehow have not as good communication channel, the answer, you, you're not correct in that in the right way, but uh, you can compensate for the semantic part. So the means, for example, so that you don't need to configure or reconfigure all the time. You can have also maybe you know you can have sometimes good, and then you can accept the degradation. And then you have reconfigure, accept the degradation, and so on. You can deal with mobility. You can deal with other things. So this is the interest. And then at the same time, uh, you see as well that if you take into account the goal of the communication, and actually sometimes the goal is not to have 100% of reliability. Maybe the goal is 90%, 80%, and so on. Then actually you can relax as well. Uh, you can oops, you can relax as well some of the setting, for which at the end you can tolerate the packet rate the receiver. Also if you do other other also if you don't do semantic, you just use the goal rent approach, then you can uh, uh, tolerate higher packet rate to achieve the same goal. So again, you can relax the constraint on the physical layer. So uh, I like to um, finish always this, uh, this example to explain what is the semantic communication. Semantic communication is like a couple, you know, that the first time they meet, they introduce nicely each other. They, they kindly uh, and probably ask for in a described way for what they want. They actually thank each other at the end. So with a very good acknowledgement. Then after some months, they know each other and they have a brief introduction. As for uh, uh, describe a request, but uh, still they're dry, and then there's a brief thank. Then several years, there's no introduction. They actually expect uh, each other to do the action, and that's for the, uh, with a very short request, and there's no thanks. So here, the point that while communicating, they're training each other to know, you know, so they they know the context, they know the, they, they know the semantic channel, and after many years, actually, you're just able to eat each other. So you, you can really drop down the quality of your, your sonar can drop down a lot. Uh, you can ask with a very quick eye contact, something you, there's no thanks, just wait for the next eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's no the next stage of that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that somehow this is the point to reduce the maximum. Okay, uh, so three short takeaways. Uh, so the goal-oriented approach, you go for the data-oriented to cont uh, and content blind communication to a goal-oriented where you check when and how is effective what you send and how you protect. Towards communication environment shaping, actually where you shape on demand 
the favorable uh, wireless communication environment and the, the semantic AI's native semantic communication where you move from content blind raw data uh, transfer to a share only what cannot be deduced or inferred by the generative AI with or without goal oriented communications. There are some papers around here, just can suggest a couple of them to, to go on, on this point. And if you have any questions, well, you can ask now or later. Uh, <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, there are there are some studies on that. Yes, and uh, and also you, I mean, is. So the question is if it's beneficial, the semantic approach, but also the goal-oriented approach. Because also in the goal-oriented approach, you can have a, an even uh, protection of the bits. Okay, so in the both cases, the, the answer is yes. My second question is really this is a very semantic, a lot of the metaphor. Right? Metaphor, well, no, okay. But, but, but this, this is the goal of the metaphor is that model is part of the Okay, so uh, for me, the, the word semantic as a, as a meaning, uh, I didn't get too much into detail, given the constraints we have on time. But um, so we speak about semantics, but at the end, what we do from the data, we extract concepts and relation between concepts. Think about the knowledge graph, the ability of knowledge graph. So you really have uh, the, the pure semantic. The difference we have with the LLM or, or its approach is that we do based on logic. So that means that my logic, my neural network uh, structure and your neural network structure, my background, your background, goes to the thing that we have a deterministic way to conclude uh, on, on, on the data, while in LLM it's, it's probabilistic. So the question, I mean, rebounding what you ask, the question we are asking, we are checking now, how you can merge this probabilistic approach with LLM with the deterministic one and semantic. But in principle, they're completely separate things. And then we can find the convergence. Because uh, again, this is also one reason because it, it's uh, it's diverging from Shannon approach where we, we are not, we do not use a statistical approach. So at the end, the, the bad part of the story, uh, maybe some nasty questions can come on that. If, I, if I'm wrong, I can be systematically wrong, okay? And I can be also convinced to be wrong, you know. So, so I mean, there's also the, the drawback of the story. So, but yes, LLM and, and semantic, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a hot topic of, of our research at the moment. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was great. I need to tell you that Shannon is uh, angry at you. He's upset at you because you started by quoting him and you did totally the inverse of what he has done. <laughs> you get rid of... Uh, uh, his way. I mean, the question is, uh, learning needs two things. I mean, training, time for the training, and memory. Uh, do you think that maybe the need of memory uh, would um, be uh, a big issue with this kind of communication? Okay, uh, th that's a very good question. So uh, the learning part, first of all, it's, uh, it's at the end what we do with the semantic communication, we learn while communicating. And actually, there's also something that I haven't said that uh, you can choose different semantic approach in the communication if you want to push more the learning or the communication. You can compress more or you compress less and use the communication as a training. Okay. Uh, for the memory, uh, yes, it's, it's a problem. Also, in uh, other approaches, uh, we are exploring in, 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 in the semantic way. But let's consider what we do we memorize from, the, from in the form of a graphs. Okay. At the end. So we have concept and relation between, uh, be, 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 between uh, concepts. So uh, the question, which is an open question, how, which is the best way to do this uh, uh, memorizing and storing these graphs? Uh, yeah, but this, uh, this, uh, this uh, I mean, your, your question is more about the volume, isn't it? Or about the, uh, how fast is the search and then? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are different- More about the, the, volume, the volume of the memory and uh, how, how to, I mean, how to uh, compress 
this count number of concepts i mean uh, yeah. that we need so, to store so one idea we are working on but this is a real fresh idea is that uh, to do that we combine this llm with semantic so we have very concise semantic memories they are some kind of uh, enlarged through the llm so okay. you, so you have few blocks and statistically you 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 put that that together so that that's the way to reduce and another thing we do uh the question is also that uh, if you have um, semantic communication, this somehow is domain dependent. Okay, depends about the domain, and and then if you need to store for every domain, you know, memory and so it's complicated. So what we do, we do, uh, we have a works uh, already done. We do this alignment between the uh, uh, light and space, for which if you have a domain, if they have some kind of matching with another domain and not, then we do kind of equalization from one domain domain to another. In order to use the knowledge from one domain, no. so we do just so we look for it's some kind of anchor memories, mm -hmm. and then we invent the the the, the distorted version of this memory for the for another domain. So there's that that tricky way to try to reduce. But of course, if you want to color everything, it's a, that's a that, that's a problem. But it's not bigger necessity than storing all the data anyway. Yeah. It's or or there's a magnitude smaller than the data. Okay, thank you so much. The search is different. The search is more complex. <laughs> thank you for the nice lecture. Uh, uh, information theoretic question. So can one link, so if you have initially a code book, if you have in semantic information, if I got it correctly, it, it, it really amounts to aggregating certain code words in a, in, in a sort of super code word, right? Or a class of code words. And so can one associate the uh, viewpoint that you develop to uh, uh, such notions of, um, I mean, aggregation of code words and the things of this nature. I mean, that, that's a, an excellent question. Um, uh, so, would associate? Uh, can we speak about compose? Yeah, compose. Yeah. Aggregate, okay. Aggregate. Yeah. Aggregate. Yeah. Uh, yeah def <laughs> definitely, it's something that uh, it's, it's of interest. Uh, in the context of CG Dysac is what we are exploring. Or we just started, actually. So yeah, of course. So uh, because at the end, what it would be the benefits really is a composition aggregation of, of uh, the code words. Either if you think about the concept, you have concept A, concept B, and then you compose together, you create a new concept. It was not there, you know. Yeah, that definitely. Uh, and also, if you want to work on that, we can discuss. <laughs> so it's a really open uh, stuff for us. Thank you. Any other questions? Friday time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>